Welcome, we're the Macomb County Genealogy Group. You can find MCGG at our blog website, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and at our YouTube channel. You can contact us at either of the listed emails on this slide. The MCGG Friday Group has been meeting for over 47 years, and our MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Discussion Group has been meeting for 15 years. During this pandemic and during the Mount Clemens Public Library's renovation, we are meeting virtually. MCGG members volunteer their time in a variety of ways to benefit the genealogy community and the Mount Clemens Public Library. This is the MCGG Friday and MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Combined Virtual Meeting, May 12, 2021. Our topic tonight is Comparing Genealogy Trees, Entering Source Citations, presented by Lisa Eschenberg, covering Family Tree Maker and Ancestry Online Member Trees, and Robert McGarry, covering Roots Magic and Ancestry Online Member Trees. If this is your first time attending a MCGG meeting, welcome. Attend a meeting and you are a member. MCGG has no dues. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to the email shown on the screen. We try to keep our emails down to a reasonable number each month, mostly meeting reminders. And now some announcements. Lee, reluctantly, but I'm here. Uh, the MCGG chair, chairperson. Um, I've been doing genealogy for, oh, over 25 years. That's scary. And, um, well, you know, I um, lead the uh, Let's Talk Genealogy Discussion Group, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob, introduce <laughs> yourself. <laughs> I'm Bob McGarry, uh, the vice chair of the MCGG, and going to be presenting tonight. I've been doing genealogy a little shorter than Lisa, about 20 plus years. Um, so, and I've used a variety of different software programs over the years, so... Um, that's about all I'm going to say tonight okay. <laughs> on that. Okay. Um, just if, hopefully most of you are familiar with the Zoom platform here. If you scroll your mouse over the Zoom windows where you're uh, probably seeing uh, the gallery view with a whole bunch of faces that you may or may not be familiar with. If you scroll to the bottom um, in the lower left corner, you'll see the mute unmute button. It's a toggle switch. So... If, it's, if your microphone's active, it says mute it, or mute, excuse me. And then if it's muted, it will say unmute. Um, if your video's on, the little icon next to it says stop video. Um, if your video's off, it will say start video. In about the middle of the bottom of the screen, if you want to see the participants list, click on it. Or if you want to not see it, click on it. If you want to see the chat, click on it. And these will, if you're in full screen view, they'll open up in a floating pop-up window. If you don't like that covering up your view of the, the, the screen, the slides, which won't be slides today, but um, if you go up to the very top of the Zoom window above the gallery of photos, um, there is a exit full screen. And then the chat and participants list will appear on your right side. And the screen will be a little, the image overall zoom window will be a little bit smaller for the image images. Um, and in the chat right now, I, hopefully you guys can all see what I put in at the beginning. 
There's links to the three handouts from tonight. If you're uh, currently on the MCGG member list, um, you receive the handouts with the meeting reminder that I sent out Monday night. If you're new here or are not on the member list, um, you can find these in the chat log and just click on the link and it'll open up to a PDF and you can save, download that to your own computer. Um, while I'm talking, Bob will repeat those links in case, uh, I think you can all see the chat from the beginning, but just in case we'll repeat them again. And question, question, what is share screen? Share screen is if um, you want to share what you're, you have on your screen. So um, Bob and I will be doing that tonight. And um, okay. so generally, unless we're doing like a let's <clears throat> talk where we're, you know, where do I go from here? That would be a, a case where a participant would be able to share their screen. But okay. so you don't need to worry about that one. It's right. just the participant, <laughs> the chat, the stop video, and mute, unmute. And so before we get started, I'm gonna ask everyone to mute your microphones and then everyone to stop your video share. And that way you will have the biggest image of our screens possible. And then when we're, when we're done presenting, um, when we go to the Q&A, we can start that again. If you need any help, I, we can do that. Okay. And where is he? Got one more. Okay, now let me get mine stopped. Oh, let me share my screen. Okay. So you can all see my very crowded screen here. Okay. In our Let's Talk genealogy discussion group meetings, we talk about sources and citations every two or three years. It was about time to revisit this topic, and this time we are looking at sources and citations in regards to genealogy programs. It's kind of a two for presentation tonight, sources and citations, and how do I do that in my genealogy program? Rather than using our Let's Talk discussion style, Bob and I will present more like a Friday style. We'll cover the, some basics of sources and citations so that everyone has a good base to start with. And then Bob and I will show how anyone can implement ev evidence explained source and citation standards into their genealogy program using Family Tree Maker 2019 and Roots Magic 7, and as possible with Ancestry Online Trees. Even if you use a different genealogy program, you should still be able to pick up some ideas to help you improve your source and citation work. So we've divided up the handout into three parts to make it easier for you. Um, so make sure you've downloaded all three from the reminder email or the from the links in the chat log. Part one is for everyone, covering source and citation basics we need to know. Part two, covers Family Tree Maker, including when syncing to an Ancestry online member tree. This latter part also works for those just using Ancestry on, an Ancestry online tree. Part three covers uh, Roots Magic and source and citations when working with Ancestry and Ancestry online member tree. As you can see from the handouts, we're going to cover some sources that are common to just about everyone, obituaries, newspaper articles, um, census, and books. What we learn from these can be applied to other sources we will encounter in our genealogy work. We realize the handouts are jam-packed. 
We likely won't cover each individual source type variation we provided for the three types we are covering, but we will explain the why you would use this template versus another. We want to leave time for a Q&A, but you all know Bob and I like to pack our presentations with information, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, let's start with some basics. There we go. Okay. For anyone out there that is not aware of where, like beginners and those returning to this hobby after being away for a while, Elizabeth Schoen Mills is the author of Evidence Explained, citing history sources from artifacts to cyberspace in its third edition revised, published in 2017. It is considered to be the Bible of genealogy sources and citations. The first three chapters are what you read. The rest of the 892 pages are reference that you refer to when deciding how to craft a source and its associated citations. From chapter two, we get an often quoted line, citation is an art, not a science. I started the handout with this because I feel it is encouragement. Once you learn the basics and guidelines, apply them and adapt them as needed. So yes, the book has a price to go with its hefty size, but you can find it on sale occasionally. And the ebook is a little bit exp less expensive. Occasionally you will see it at used booksellers, but make sure you don't pay more for a used copy than you would a new copy. Um, do you know that you can find evidence explained in libraries too? Our library cooperative has one copy of the third edition, one of the second edition, and four of the original 2007 edition available to check out. Libraries are great resources to access books and other items at no to little cost. Some libraries only have it as a reference, but I mention, these that I mentioned can be checked out and even delivered to your library for convenience. If you are not from this area, check out your own library system. Elizabeth Schoen Mills also has a website and a Facebook page that goes with the EE Tome. They are free. There are lots of excerpts from the book and a user form on the website to ask questions, which EE herself even answers. So even if you don't have the book, there are ways to learn more. Your handout also includes a few other resources to help you with the sources and citations. Most genealogy programs have incorporated evidence explained in some fashion. Usually they provide users with a preset templates for various sources. Some might go further and provide guidance in some fashion to crafting the format of the citation while other programs seem to leave the citation up to you. Having access to EE or some aspect of it helps in deciding which source format template to use and how to craft the citation portion, what elements to include and how. To be clear, citing sources or source citation actually refers to two related things. Sources are from where the information is obtained, such as an artifact, a book, a document, a website, whose facts about it are unchanging, author title, publication date, it's the what you are looking at. Citations are the statements, the details in which we identify our source or sources for a particular assertion that have two purposes. One, to record the specific location of each piece of data and two, to record the details affecting the use and evaluation of that data. You can have a single citation or multiple citations to one source. For example, the source, a book, mentions third great grandpa on page 102, that would be a citation, and second great grandma and grandpa on page 250, another citation, and obviously the details that you're citing. In addition, one citation can be attached linked to just one fact event or multiple facts and events for a single person or for multiple people. A census is a great example, source example of this type of source. Um, generally, a census enumeration, the source, you find a family household that has, not only has one or more people, but the census can be used to support multiple facts for each household member. 
such as their name, the age, the general birthplace, and often the parents' birthplaces, as well as occupation, race, and many other facts, depending on the year of the census. So in addition to the variance in how each program handles sources and citations and how guidance is implemented, gene programs also have some variance in the terminology that they use. Knowing this and keeping it straight will help you in the long run. Citation detail in Family Tree Maker, the details to record the specific location of that piece of information, is referred to in Roots Magic as source details. Citation text in Family Tree Maker, pertinent details from source or relevance to the research, is noted in Roots Magic as detailed text slash research notes. There are some simple basic citations for sources used a book and this page said. There are some basic citations involving simple layering used a book, this page said, and I accessed it this way. And then there are more complex citations for sources involving what seems to be compact, complex citation layering. The later editions of Evidence Explained talk about citation layering more than the earlier editions, but the website talks about citation layering more than anything else. Regardless of all the citations involved, regard, excuse me, regardless, all citations involve understanding what it is you are using as your source and what the source is using as is its source and leaving a trail or direction so you or someone else can find it again. Okay, some terminology that you often see when you are layering citations is citing means the source I have just identified is citing the following as its own source. If our source does not cite its source, then there is no need to use the word citing. So you often see imaged from, where the data came from. You use, one use of this is when you identify the source of the source, but the source doesn't specifically cite it itself. So when anti Ancestry is digitizing a family history library microfilm and its own citation does not specifically say so, but you may be able to realize it by the images themselves or in the abstracted data of the electronic index. This is one way you can point that out. Imaged as is the format used. Um, another way to say it is consulted as or consulted through the medium through which we viewed the image or how we access the item. Accessed by, accessed as is another option. How the route, how or route item was accept, accessed, viewed, or found. Uh, and format and content usually refers to, I looked at a database, a database and images, images, digital images and index, browsable images, PDF, images and PDF. So it's, it's what, what specific format am I looking at? Depending on what you're using citing, the layering of citations can take several forms. It can describe what, where something is in the collection or what you accessed and the path back to the original source of the document image you are viewing, or even your own description or analysis of the source. The order of the layers depend upon what you are emphasizing, the document or the database based provider. Um, if you look at the evidence explained website, quick lesson 19 talks all about this. So you can cite the database and the specific item of interest. And then a second layer would be report what the website identifies as the source of its images. You can cite the item image of interest and then the second layer would be what um, derivative you consulted. And then the third layer would be what that derivative cited as the source of its source. The source, excuse me, the source of our source. Um, and there's a few other ways to do it. Building your citation, 
you decide what details you need to include to properly identify what you are citing so you or someone else can find it again. For each detail, ask yourself, how, where did I learn that? The database website, the original image, or the source of the source. Then assign use that detail in the appropriate layer of the citation. This will keep your citation layer separate and not mixed up like a casserole. And remember, citation is an art, not a science. So now let's look at the programs. Bob and I are going to switch back and forth so that our family tree maker and our Roots Magic people don't get bored, either waiting for their program or the Q&A portion. It will also help everyone see how each program is different. Um, each program has positives and negatives. I think we decide which parts we like more when decide, making a decision as to which program to use. I'm going to be showing Family Tree Maker 2019. And this information is good for this version 2019 and any of the similar prior versions. Let me clean up my desktop here. And that, okay, so there are three ways to add sources in Family Tree Maker files. From the People workspace, the Tree View tab, which is what we have here. Um, I've adjusted my monitor resolution, so hopefully the text is all big enough for you. So in the data entry panel on the right, the citations can be added to the facts appearing in the panel. Now I've got some custom, added some facts here aside from birth and death. So you see a little bit more here. These icons on the side are where you would click to add a source to the fact that appears here. If no citations are linked, you see a piece of paper with a quill. And when a citation exists, you see a piece of paper with a plus sign. Another way to add sources Okay, good. Um, is in the People Workspace, the Person View tab. You select and highlight, let me get this down here. Okay, select and highlight a, a fact and it appears in the right data entry um, column. And below the, the fact, you will see a source tab and then some buttons underneath that, which all pertain to that source tab. So you can add new, we're slowing, oh, there we go. All right, um, so this workspace view tab is the one that makes it easy to work with one person or family at a time. You can quickly select facts, you can add facts, you can quickly change to someone else, and then back again and do all that work there. Now, the other place you could add sources is from the sources workspace. And you can also go to, so sort sources in the sources workspace appear on the left-hand column in a list where you can add edit. You can also go edit manage sources and you can use this edit through the menu in any of the workspaces uh, of Family Tree Maker. There's seven of them and in Family Tree Maker they allow you in my words to view your tree from different points of view, your media, your people, your workspace. So in the top center panel, you see the various citations attached to sources. And as you click on a citation, it appears in the right-hand uh, data entry column. Below in the center, these are the links to where that citation has been used. So it has been used for Edward Charles on his name and on his residence for 1910 for this particular source citation. This workspace, it makes it easy to work from a source with a source and create citations for everyone in your tree who can cite it from that single source. All right, let's get started with creating a source citation for an obituary. 
that can't be too hard, right? Um, it really isn't, but the question you start with, with any source you're working with, is what are you looking at working with? A photocopy of a newspaper a bit made by viewing a microfilm and properly labeled. A clipping you clipped yourself and properly labeled, of course. You did that, right? Um, a clipping you inherited from someone who didn't properly label and won't be named. Um, a clipping or a whole page you save from as an image or a PDF from an online newspaper archive. The answer to what makes a difference in what source template you use. And then another question can come into play. What do you want to emphasize? The original, the Im image of the original, or the database you used found the image in or something else. I'm going to start by going to the edit menu and selecting manage sources. Here is where you can see a list of your sources, edit them, replace them, create a, a new one. And if I click new, there are two ways to find a template. Click the more and then select, go through and start drilling down to the type of document that you want to choose or type a keyword. I type obituary, I come up with four, or excuse me, five templates to choose from. If I type newspaper, I come up with four templates. So your keyword you use can um, cause some variance. I'm gonna start, um, you can access this um, window from any of the workspaces. Let's say I'm looking at a photocopy of an obituary from a newspaper on microfilm. The question I would next have to deal with is what do I want to emphasize? Since we're dealing with a print, we have two choices, emphasis on location or on the newspaper name. When I compare the examples of the templates, they're not too different from each other. In other cases, there may be a big difference in the formatting of the source. My personal preference is by newspaper name. It allows me to use the source for multiple citations and I can clearly find this particular source in the sources list. I can more easily remember a newspaper name rather than the city in which it was printed. So let's fill out that information that we know. Comb Daily, Michigan, assuming I spell it right. City, Mount Clemens, Source Repository, our favorite library. Most times you'll find a call number or some other identification. Um, once in a while you won't. Sometimes it's because of the poor labeling that was done when you found the item. Or in this case, I don't believe there was a call number, but there was a description such as Macomb Daily and a date range and year. Um, because I want to use this source for multiple citations, issues and years, I've kept it simple instead. And I'm just going to put Film. If there was a call number range of reels, I would put that in to cover all possible reels. So that creates our source. But I've got a trick that I've developed. The Commons field does not print in the majority of the applications, aside from when you are printing a sources list from a, the published workspace. So I use it to store a template or format of how I want the citation detail to be worded and structured for this particular source. How do I figure out this template format? Family Tree Maker has a pop-up suggestion when you hover over the mouse pointer over the entry field. And I consult my EE book, Evidence Explained book. So 
Following that, I created and entered this for my newspaper articles, such as obituaries. There. And that's actually in the handout too. Now I just need to view the source entry for my list and copy my cheat before I create the citation. Now, alternately, I could store this information in a Word, Word file and copy and paste also. So let's create a source citation for this um, source. I'm in the People Workspace Person View tab right now. I've selected death, fact, and I'm gonna say new, add new source citation. Up in here, I'm going to go down and select the source I just created. And then I'm going to paste in my template. And then I'm going to tweak the text for my particular citation, which to save time, I've already typed and will go faster here. Um, now you'll notice I'm missing information on here in this citation. It's probably page four based on what I know about this newspaper, but I'll have to add it to my research to-do list to recheck that fact. Because um, we didn't, whoever copied the um, obituary didn't write down the page number. So I could include columns numbers if I know them, and I inc could include the date the copy was made. But if you don't recall it, don't panic or worry about it. In the grand scheme of things, yes, it's nice to know what day you uh, made the copy, but it doesn't change anything likely. So I skipped the access date and included a layer to indicate I looked at microfilm rather than original newspaper. And that's one beauty of some of these templates is that you can add those layers and make them multi-purpose. Um, it's up to you if you want to do a complete transcription of the item that you're working with, such as the obituary. I have already typed it, so I'm going to add it into the citation text. Um, if you have a scanner and an OCR program, that's one way to do it also. Um, and then you can decide over well, I'll show you in a minute, um, right down here, is to include um, the citation text in your um, citation or not to. Um, you can, at the same time you're creating this, add media. Now to add media, you need to first, um, to attach new media, you need to get the link create a fam link in Family Tree Maker. If the media is already in Family Tree Maker, you can just click link to existing media. And we can find the obituary and attach it. Now you can also add the media later after the fact too. So that is creating a citation for an obituary. Now with media, there are three ways to add media to the person's fact event, straight to it, to a source, in which case that media appears connected to all the cite citations linked to the source, and I'll show you that in a minute, or to a citation like we just did, in which case the media only appears connected to that citation. And yes, a single media file can be linked to in multiple ways. So what if we have an obituary from an online archive like newspapers.com? Here we go. 
Well, then we would use one of the other source templates. Remember, there were two choices for a newspaper article online. Let's bring that up real quick. We have by author name and by newspaper name. I personally prefer the newspaper name because most obituaries, which are what most of my articles are, don't have bylines, but I can easily remember a newspaper's name. So I'm going to usually for myself, click on the online archive by newspaper name. Now to save some time, we're gonna pretend that I've typed this out and we're gonna to go to this one and we just type this. Um, so it asks some of the information that we answered for the previous template that we used, but it's also asking information about the online archive that we used. So you just fill in what you know Now, again, I created a citation detail for this, and it's actually the same thing that I used for an obituary on microfilm or a print version. So again, to create a citation, I copy it, and then I would go and create it for the person that I'm working with. We're gonna take a look at what I did here. So I changed that text to adjust for what I'm working with, obituary. We don't have an, an author. We have the, type, the headline. We have the date. We have the page, the column number in this case. And th this time I used the date we accessed it. And then I attached the media. Now, back over here, I didn't fill in the year that the website was last updated is because reason is I'm referring to this, using this source for multiple times that I have gone in and found an obituary. And this website is updated about every week. So to me, it didn't make sense to put the excess year there. But I did add it with when I, downloaded that uh, obituary. Now I didn't have any, didn't add any citation text for this one, but, and that's personal preference, but I do have the image attached. So that kind of helps that out. Now I can go back later and type it in if I desire. Now, what if that first obituary for George we used was instead just a clipping? And we know who we got it from, but the clipping may not have been labeled at all or only partially labeled. Remember the under, other template possibility when we typed obituary in the edit menu, the artifact private holding. Oops, hit the right spot. This one. We're going to use that now and because I know we all have a lot of clippings we've gotten from mom, dad, grandma, aunt, uncle. So let's take a look at how I filled this out. So here I've only partially filled in who compiled the collection because um, I'm not going to out who didn't fill in all the details. Um, so then you, I'm going to describe what I'm working with as newspaper clippings. And for creation date, I put various because these clippings are from lots of different years. And since I want to keep the provenance of all the um, different clippings together, I'm just putting very various and then that way I can cite all the different um, clippings and I know where they came from with one source. Um, the current owner, I put in myself, but for my privacy here, I've changed some of the details. And then I've added my little cheat sheet, and it's very similar to um, what I've used for the other obituary 
template choices, but I, when I enter the information, you'll see in a second here, it's a little bit different, but essentially it's the same. Got the name of the obituary, which is like the title. Um, I've described it as an obituary clipping um, and that it's hand dated with whatever dates on it. And for page, I put unknown or uh, in the handle, I think I had question mark because I don't know the page because it wasn't on there, it wasn't labeled. And then I added um, my commentary on this particular obituary because there may sometimes be a likely suspect, but you haven't confirmed it yet as to which newspaper it came from. And um, so I've added my educated thought regarding the clipping's own origin. And that way I, you know, I can add also to a separate research uh, to-do list that check this newspaper and see if this obituary did indeed come from there. So that's three variances of how to do an obituary. And now we're gonna switch screens to Bob and he's gonna cover obituaries in Roots Magic. So you can not only see how it's done in Roots Magic, but also see the similarities and differences between the two. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, um, can everybody see Roots Magic okay? In, in Roots Magic, there's three ways to enter sources. Um, you can call up an edit person from the pedigree, the family, the descendants, or the people section, um, which is one way to do it. So when it comes up, you have the information about the person and the column here with the little, little certificate-like thing indicates there's a source. Um, you can enter them from the timeline, which is usually where I prefer to work because on the timeline, it has the same information there, but it also includes the, uh, the spouse, the parents, uh, the children and the siblings. So I can actually quickly move and open, uh, open a screen to any person that's related to the person. So this is usually the section, I know I'm moving it back and forth that I work in most of the time. And thirdly, you can enter them in the source list by clicking add a new source, which brings up the source types. In Roots Magic, um, when you click on a source, it gives you a description of the of that of that source type, um, and it also gives you the references for evidence explained and the quick sheets. Some of the source types in here, they have over 400 of them. Some of the source types in here were based on previous works, um, evidence, citation, and uh, history for. Um, the Family Historian, which was uh, Elizabeth Schoen Mill's prior work from Evidence Explained, and uh, a work from Richard Latchkey, which was Cite Your Sources, that um, Elizabeth Schoen Mills took over. But that uh, that work was the original work on sourcing in uh, genealogy programs. So let's go and look at our source, our obituary source. So. Um, I've already, I've already got it in there. So we've got the Macomb Daily on microfilm. We'll go ahead and edit so you can see what I did. In Roots Magic, the source, the master source, um, and it's showing up in the up here in this corner, the um, newspaper print edition. Um, okay. The newspaper print edition source type. Um, you have to give your source a name, and this is the name of that source, Macomb, Michigan, Macomb Daily Print Microfilm. Um, so I've created that master source for all sources from the Macomb Daily. Macomb Daily, uh, the title of the newspaper with the place and the published place. Those are always in yellow in Roots Magic 7. The details or the actual citation is in green. So in, um, in this case, it's gonna ask us specific questions about the content and where the content is. And then it's going to actually show us our footnote as it creates it and our short footnote and our bibliography. It also will give us our research notes, which we can then add text, which would come in the source text or the comments. And that relates to the master source. 
the detailed text, which I put in the research notes, basically I took the um, the picture, the JPEG of the of the obituary that um, that Lisa sent me to do this source citation, and I um, OCR'd it um, using a free using a couple of free OCR um, resources that if you show up next month you will hear about um, the media. I can put it to the source, or I can put it to the detail, or I can see all the media related to this. I put this one on the detail, um, and I can also attach it to a repository. Uh, so that's the basic source for doing a source from a from a print or microfilm newspaper. And again, as you can see, my so in my annotation. I access the this from microfilm, so I'm I'm making it very clear that it was not the the print print edition. It was done from microfilm. Um, so let's look at an online source. Close out of that. And we'll come over here and do an online source. So this was an online. So I'm going to edit that. Um, Newspaper online images. So again, I set up a master source, gave it a name, Wayne, Michigan, Detroit Free Press, newspapers.com. The newspaper was the Detroit Free Press, Detroit Free Press, Detroit, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. Edition type online images at newspapers.com. Um, I didn't have a name of a collection. And then the article title, it's an obituary, the issue date. Um, a specific content, page two, column five, six. Uh, it will automatically default to accessed, so I didn't put anything in there. And the date we the date it was accessed, um, credit line. If you need if you need a source for a source, you'd put it in here, and then any commentary about the source. Again, uh, master text would put it to the source. Detail text again from the JPEG. I was able to OCR this um, media. Uh, is on there and the repository I didn't didn't fill in for that. Um, so now for the source from a uh, clipping. Let's go back to this one. Click on that because I've got two sources and Lisa sent me over a little bit on that and that a copy of that clipping. So I um, use that as the other, Lisa's the owner, address compiled by Neiman. And in this case, it's an, I, it's, I listed it as a single artifact um, rather than the collection. Uh, I could have done it as a collection, but there's a, and the, the handout talks about the, the logic of using them. Either one would have been right. Um, but again, there's our, um, there's our information. And you can see my OCR, which I didn't clean it up where the hyphens are, but you can see that that was OCR into that um, into that source. So those are the three sources Lisa cited. I cited the same sources in uh, in Roots Magic to show you how they work. Um, so uh, now I'm going to switch it back to um, Lisa. Okay, we are back in Family Tree Maker. Let's take a look at sourcing a census. One of the selling points of Family Tree Maker has been its ability to work with Ancestry.com when you have a personal home subscription to help you enter data quickly into your tree file by merging information from the various record collections. And while doing so, having that data automatically cited in a media image downloaded as well if you desire it. It's not perfect. It can quicken the data entry process, but it will likely require some cleanup to meet genealogical standards, especially with your locations um, in your tree. Um, your family tree maker file does not have to be synced with an um, online tree to use the Ancestry web search merge. You just have to have a data subscription. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with the library edition, um, but you can always manually add in what you find. So the web search workspace can do other types of data capture besides um, with other websites 
too, but I'm not going to cover those today because they work a little differently. Um, web search merge can be done with a wide variety of data. And I'm going to show you the source and citation resulting from a census so you can see what you get and how you can modify it. I'm not going to show the merge from the ancestry itself, just in case we have bandwidth problems tonight. And we were having a little bit fun earlier before we let everyone in. So in the sources workspace, I'm going to show you what I did, and this will save us some time. I'm going to click on this source. This is the one that is created when I did a web search merge with um, Ancestry. Um, notice that the web search merge does not use a preset source and citation template, which would be listed here if we used one. It's actually the default no template format. And yes, they use this despite there being some templates for online archives. Um, this automated process varies with each data collection. Sometimes the data about the source of the source is added to the source comments, as we see they did here. What is added to the citation detail varies and likely doesn't follow always follow evidence explained formatting. As you can see here, most of the U.S. Census enumerations were early data collections on Ancestry, so most have more information in their citations than, say, newer um, data collections. Sometimes information is added to the citation text field. Um, like we see here, sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes information is added to the facts, events, description field that are added as you're merging the data. Usually a link to the web address of the downloaded document image is included, which you see down in here. And again, you can include them in the reference note or not. It's up to you. So here's the Ancestry Web Merge source for the 1910 census. And it's pretty basic, but you know, with this information it does bring in, you can take that and adjust the citation detail to more closely follow EE. And we'll show you in the next example how to do that. But you're all this information here in the detail will help you do that. The information here telling you about the source of the source will help you. I'm going to cancel out of this for the moment. So generally, oops, let's go back there. As long as you don't edit the source itself, meaning the data in this window right here on top, long as you don't edit that, you can edit and alter the citation detail in the text to be what you want it to be without messing up the um, programming behind the Ancestry and the Family Tree Maker merge um, so that the sources stay in that you've brought in stay with that um, particular at, um, web merge source. So what do you change the citation detail? Follow the format in the, uh, the census template examples to come. There's a lot it we can use from here. Um, in Family Tree Maker 2019, you can once again rename the downloaded media image during the merge process instead of having to wait until after the merge process to rename that meaningless numbers and letters file name to a name that works with your file naming process. And you have one of those, right? We've had a few meetings about that. Okay, with any record type, unless a relationship is stated in a record and is part of the abstracted index information, the Family Tree Maker Ancestry Web Merge will not merge the data and citation for any others in the household or involved in the record. For example, federal census enumerations for 1870 and before prior 
do not state relationships in the household. So only the person of your search result is merged. There's two ways to fix this. Search for each person and merge them separately or copy paste the fact with the source citation attached to the others in the household. So continuing our quick look at census, In Family Tree Maker, there are actually 25 templates for census enumerations. You can divide these into categories for original manuscripts, microfilm, online images, and derivatives, like indexes. Um, and you can see some are for specialized enumerations. In addition to these, you can use the digital archive template. Which you can see here. It also fits because nowadays we're mostly using census from a digital archive. And by showing you this template, you can see how it would work for other types of digital archives. Those data collections, which are like chapters of a book, those data collections on the website. So, Use the digital archive template if you're manually, manually adding documents and data that you found using an online collection from a website like Ancestry, MyHeritage, Find My Past, Family Search. Then format your citation deal to the for, detail to the in the format that is needed for the type of document data you're using. Use your evidence explained to guide you. For example, a census found on Ancestry shown in the example, um, vital records, probate. Um, in this template, the online data collection is the focus. So we're going to, to pretend we're speed typing here. And we're going to quickly type out a digital archive template for the 1910 census, which you can see here. So we've got the exact title that was used for the data collection. We've described the collection format, it's digital images and an index, the website creator owner. Because the website title and the creator owner are the same, you only have to fill out one of these. The URL, I generally go with the main URL of the website. You could go with the main, the URL to the collection, but a lot of times that's really, really long. Um, the only time I kind of use that collection URL is like family search, because if you notice family search, each different data collection has a specific number. And so that's a lot shorter. So I, I will often use that. Um, again, the year, because it's I'm accessing it at different times or it's been updated, I'm not so worried about the year. And that's a personal choice. And again, I created a um, cheat sheet uh, citation detail format for myself based on the information. And this one's a little different. Most of the time with the digital archive, you're starting with the document and the path to the document and describing the digital part first and then where the source, their source is. For um, Elizabeth Schoen Mills, um, the census one for a digital, for a um, online images, it looks like this, essentially. And so um, if you don't want to go to such a detail, you know, you can just do entry for who, who, whose ever household it is, the locality, county, and state. That would be a quick way to do it. And you can go back later and fill in the information. But if you want to be a little bit more detailed so you know what you're exactly looking at, this is the type of um, citation detail that you want to use. So let's take a look at the actual one we did. So population schedule, we got the location down to the numeration district, we got the sheet, um, we got the page, the way it was stamped, the way it was written. Um, 
dwelling number, the family number, the street in this case. Um, if you're dealing with an earlier census, you're going to do page and line number um, because it won't have dwelling and uh, family number. Um, and you got the head of the household and then that ancestry is citing the family history microfilm for this particular entry and also citing the NARA microfilm, which the family search film is the NARA film, but with the family search number. Um, or if you're, um, when you're dealing with a digital archive, usually what you will see is digital images and index path, and then the image number, the entry, the page number, enumeration district, citing, citing, um, but Elizabeth Schoen Mills chooses to um, do it this way. Um, so that's what that would look like. And you could, of course, attach the media and then extract any information you want from the image. Now, one tip I gave you in the handout is that websites often provide basic source citation that you can use to locate the information you need to build the citation detail closer to the evidence explained formatting. So um, you're going and the sources of the source information, you're gonna find this information in the about this database in your search results view record below the abstracted information. And on family search, you'll also locate it below the in image viewer window, just click the little tab so it pops up and see how their simple um, uh, source citation is. And again, how, what, how you format the citation detail depends on what you're working with. Now, let's look at another template option. Um, this is census online commercial site generic digital census digital image by census year. If you're manually adding your census documents, this is another template that you could use um, when you found the documents on an online collection from a website like Ancestry or My Heritage Find My Past. It's also helpful for when you want to be want to be to specify which type of enumeration schedule you are using, such as the population, the mortality, the agricultural, and then format your citation detail in the format needed for the type of census that you're using and use EE to guide you. And again, the census, the citation detail is very similar with the other census templates we've gone through. Um, there is another variation of this template. It's um, online commercial site, generic census, digital image by year and location, but you'll need to create a source not only for every year of the census, but for every location. My personal opinion is that it's ju just using the census year is sufficient and it keeps your source groups list on the left here cleaner and it's easier to find the source that you want. Okay, let's quickly look at a book template, just a basic book print edition. And we're gonna open this one because I magically typed this. And it's pretty straightforward template in which you gather the information from the book's title page and its verso, the copyright page to fill out the information fields. There's additional templates for various types of books, such as multi-volume works and several others. Um, the citation detail is pretty straightforward. Just indicate the page or pages that you are citing and then type the text in the citation text of what, of what particular part of the, the page you are referencing. Now, while this template is designed for a basic printed book, you can utilize it further by using Citation Layer when you're consulting an ebook or a PDF file of a digitized previously printed book, like all those old local history books. Add a semicolon and the phrase consulted as saying where you found it, or um, 
for example, consulted as PDF archive.org in the archives um, URL or um, consult it as and give the file name that you downloaded, archive.org and the URL. This is helpful if you've already cited the printed version and now you've found additional information by utilizing the searchable PDF file version of the same book. Um, I want to include a book so you can see the difference between a source citation created in, in an Ancestry online tree and a source citation created from the family tree maker side. And you can see this difference in your handout. So now we are going to roll on and you to the using of an Ancestry member online tree. Let's close that up. So I have an Ancestry online tree synced to this uh, tree file that I've been using in Family Tree Maker. On Ancestry online trees, you're going to add sources in on the profile view. So I'm going to click on Edward here and go to his profile. So if the middle column here, or second column, depending if you have the side opened up, um, is the sources. And you click on a source and, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. And it will draw little lines and tell you which facts and events that it's linked to. So in the sources, there are three types. Ancestry sources, which appear on top, and those are the ones that you add, added utilizing ancestry saved to a person in your tree from the website um, when you're in your online tree or when utilizing Family Tree Maker's web search merge. There are other sources, those you create yourself in your tree from the website side and those you create from inside Family Tree Maker. But take note that not all the Family Tree Maker side create a sources and citations will appear in the online side of the sync tree in the same way. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. A web links is the third type and those are created only on the online tree side and they stay on the online tree side. They don't appear in the family tree maker side. So if you need a reminder of what syncs between a family tree maker tree file and an online tree, uh, for Family Tree Maker 2019 Companion Guide, see Chapter 12. The PDF page is 275 and 276 for a list of what syncs and doesn't. Web links are very simple. You add a web link. And I'm just going to show you here so I don't have to type it all. You copy paste the URL from the website page that you are looking at. And then you create a link name, which is just a shorter description or better description of what it is you're linking to. So this is a photograph actually from the Suburban Library Cooperative's digital archive of the Prees Department Store in Mount Clements. Um, since it's a copyrighted photograph, I can't download it and include it in my tree but I can create a link to it. And then that link will take me or anyone I invite into my tree, or if it's a public tree, anyone who sees my tree, it will take them to that digital archive. Other sources are those that you create yourself from the online side or from inside Family Tree Maker. So I'm going to go to, Lewis. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. All right. I know what I got to do, added the source. All right, so when you go to use the other sources, you're going to create a, site, a source if you don't already have it in, or you're going to select a source you already have. And so 
there's not too many entries to uh, to use when you're creating a source. You've got a title, an author, a publisher, a publisher location, publisher date, a call number, and a note. The RF and a number is refers to your genealogy program. I don't use them, so I'm not going to worry about it. And a repository. Where where is this item? Um, you do your best in filling this out based on the source that you are creating. And then remember to save it because ours already exist. You'll see that. So like if I had clicked the add source directly, it would first ask about the source and then create the source. It's really tied together there, which is fine. Then for a citation, again, there's only a few entry points. And yeah, you can apply evidence explained to this. You just gotta, it, it may be a little bit more difficult, but it can be done because there's only five entry points. Once you have your citation made, you're going to select which facts that it should be linked to. Now for something that's already created, you can go and edit it. So if I need to edit the citation, I can do that. You see, I entered page, the page and then the transcription and I didn't need to fill in the rest. And then I could, if anything else applied, I could add additional facts or remove them. So that's how you would create your own sources and citations on the online tree. Now, what does do these look like from the other side? So we just looked at a book we created on the Ancestry online side over in Family Tree Maker. This is what it looks like. It doesn't use a template. Got the title and it's basically filled out. And the citation detail and the text come in like that. Now, if you recall, when we created a book basic template, we have the author and most of the other information that the other one has. So that's what this one looked like over here. Now, over in Ancestry, this is what the family tree maker version looked like. Got the transcript, the detail, the title, uh, the author and title are smudged together and then most of the information is smudged together in the note. Um, so it looks a little different, got the essential information. I wanted to show what it looked like creating it from each side. Now, one aspect that I haven't talked about is analyzing and evaluating your source citations. Look for the gold star in the source citation area to analyze and evaluate and rate a particular source and citation for the fact event you're using to support or refute. In the sources workspace, you'll see with the citations, because you're rating a citation, the little gold star here. So, there are two ways to rate it in Family Tree Maker. You can use a quality score, which is si simple, um, five-star rating or four-star rating here. Um, or you can use standardized ratings, which coordinates with the evidence explains evidence analysis research process map, which is in the front cover of that big EE tome. You can go through and rate the source original derivative. Now for 2019, I wish they had updated this because there's actually authored now. This has been updated. So author and information have, I think it's information, have um, a couple more choices there. Yeah, information. Source, information, and evidence have an additional third um, parameter. So as you click through and 
enter your quality measure, it's primary, it's secondary, the number of stars go up or down. And then each of these quality ratings has a justification field where you can type information so you remember why you chose to rate this or chose to rate this particular citation this way. Um, was the writing not clear? Um, is it direct evidence or indirect evidence? You know, you can do your justification there. So in the um, sources workspace, you'll find it here as you click on the citations and you just click the star and rate it and you'll see the rating go in. Um, some of these I haven't rated yet. Over in the people workspace, the person view, you'll find the star right here. So just make sure you select the citation you wanna rate, click the star, choose it. This one, you can tell blue stars are the quality and the gold stars are the evidence explained um, method. Now for more information, see the quick lesson 17, the evidence analysis process map on the evidence explained website. So Bob, back to you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, Roots Magic has the capability of picking up web hints from Find My Past and My Heritage, whether you have accounts with them or not. It also will pick up Ancestry if you, if you transfer the tree online, or it allows you to download an online Ancestry tree and work with that as your database and family search. But in both cases, you need to be logged in. Um, I don't think... I don't think you need to have an actual paid ancestry subscription to get the web hints, but you do have to have an online tree. So looking at ancestry, there we are. It gives me all of our web hints. Now I can look at a web hint and I can choose to accept it or reject it. Um, if I accept it, it's just going to mark it as accepted. It's not going to do anything. But it's also showing me on the Ancestry side what the web hint's going to do so I can actually download that web hint and create a source right into Roots Magic from Ancestry uh, without, um, without changing the, uh, the Ancestry online tree. Or if I, if I check these and download them in from here, it will actually put these in the Ancestry online tree and bring them into Roots Magic. Um, so I do, I'm not gonna do another one. I'm gonna show you that one in a second. So if we open up, um, whoop. hang on a second. This is the one bad thing about seven is it puts things where I out of sight for me. Uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second while I fix this. If you, anyone has any questions, you can add them to the chat if you want, or you can ask them live yourself when we're done presenting. I put the handout links again in the chat, so you should be able to spot them. Just click on them and then open up a PDF in your browser, and you can just download it and save it to your computer. These are the same ones that were in um, the remi meeting reminder email. Share. We're back. Okay. So I'm going to show you a, um, a census record that was downloaded from Ancestry. Um, so it actually came in as an Ancestry record. Um, the master source Ancestry.com. It gives the title of the database the published place, the Ancestry operations. And this is basically the citation that Ancestry downloaded or it downloaded from Ancestry year 2010, place Mount Clemens, Ward 2, Macomb, Michigan, roll, um, page, enumeration district, uh, and the FHL film number. So it's pretty close to um, what uh, um, EE is looking for. Uh, I could change that by re redoing this detail down here. Um, 
and it also gives the source text, the quote from Ancestry, and it puts nothing in the detailed text, so there's room for me to put the transcription in there. Um, so that's a source downloaded from Ancestry. I can also download from, I'm going to show you the family search, is if you're connected to family search, it will look for the family search person and it will compare the family search online tree with your tree. So if, if I want to download a fact and source from there, I can do that. Um, I did that for an example. So let me go into George Pries here and I believe, yeah, this one was downloaded from uh, family tree um, and it uses just a free form basis. It, it adds the footnote, the short footnote and the bibliography and the page number, but it's a one of type source uh, for that particular entry. I don't recommend doing this, but I just wanted to see what it would, what it would do. But the other nice thing about the uh, family search is if you're going to use the online tree, you can upload directly from Roots Magic to that. I don't have an example of that since this isn't actually my research I'm working with, and I don't want to upload to a tree for somebody or a, some, a person for someone I'm not researching actively. Um, but this number here next to the person's name is their ID on family search. So it automatically will download and find that for you if it can match the person to the family search database. Um, the last source I want to look at is one that we entered. Um, so this is another census record. And this, I use the Census US Federal Online Images. There are, if I do census, there are a lot of them, and not just for US censuses, but for, for foreign censuses as well. Um, when you're doing a federal online image template, your master source is at the count, should be at the county level. I know Roots Magic and a couple other programs do that, recommend doing that, and that becomes the jurisdictional box of Macomb County. Um, you're in type 1900 census, the schedule, population schedule, or you can leave that default of its population schedule if it's another schedule. You can use it item type, digital images, ancestry.com, and then the credit line. Um, you know, the civil division, the remuneration district, the sheet 22, um, the household ID, the person of interest, the access type, again, it's defaults to access, so I usually don't type anything in there. And your access date, there it creates your, um, your footnote, your short footnote, and your bibliography. And then the research notes, I transcribe the um, the census line into the detailed text for research notes, and then added the added the media as well uh, for that. As far as quality, uh, again, the similar to the um, as described in information explained, you you can set source quality on all your sources, and when we go back up into the um, citation, you'll see that under the quality line. Well, it's said here, the defaults are don't know, don't know, don't know, um, source original derivative, information primary, secondary, evidence direct, indirect, or negative, which is the third one that Elizabeth Schoen Mills adds. And again, if you want to explain it, you can add that to the comments. Let's go look at a book. Age. So a book source, again, we'll pretend that I typed it, um, gave it a name, past and present of Macomb County, the author, the title, um, the subtitle, the published place, the publisher, the published date, um, digital images from Internet Archive on archive.org. Um, you, again, if it, if I downloaded the PDF file and was accessing it from that, I would put PDF file instead of digital um, digital images. Um, 
the date you access the site, the page number, and an annotation, which basically is what the what the source credit line was. Um, I could add that to the to the research notes or the detailed text as well. Um, media, and I that one came over as a PDF. If I would would have pulled the JPEG out of the PDF, you'd actually see the media. And uh, again, on on source, I would put the title page and on detail, I would put the actual page it came from um, and it's pointing to a file on my hard drive. Uh, I think that covers it. Um, I think it, at this point we should open it up for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and start my video and we can open it up for questions. <laughs> okay, great. We did good, Bob. <laughs> my, my alarm was set for 8.30. We did good. <laughs> All right. Um, David has a question in the chat, and I'm not exactly sure of the answer because I have moved my stuff. So his question is, do the differences between the source citations in different programs make it difficult to move between programs? And the answer to that is it depends on the it depends on the program and how it moves. Um, certain programs are good at in, in bringing text or bringing information in from other programs. But for programs that aren't very good at that or programs that are incompatible, you've got to use GEDCOM. And unfortunately, GEDCOM has not been supported for many, many years. So a lot of the, the newer source template type stuff does not transfer very well in that scenario. Um, but a lot of times it will convert what the other program had into more of a free form source and just bring the citation over. And that's probably the best, best way I have seen. Um, my, my databases started out in Family Tree Maker many, many, many years ago. Um, moved to legacy and are now in Roots Magic. And some of my, of course, um, we didn't know a lot as much about sourcing as we knew, uh, as we know today. Um, although when I made the move from Family Tree Maker to Legacy, it was because of um, Elizabeth Mills's first book. Uh, and it seemed like at Family Tree Maker at that time didn't really do that, that book justice. And uh, the legacy templates were built from that book. But um, if I go back and look at some of my early, early sources, they're quite ugly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I can add to this. Um, when I was trying to give you a file to work with, so you didn't have to type everything all over. Mm -hmm. um, I had done this in converted this to Family Tree Maker 2019. Mm -hmm. But Roots Magic seven came out before 2019 so roots magic seven couldn't take a family tree maker 2019 file so i had to downgrade it to uh the part i was exporting to a family tree maker oh did i have to go down 2014 i think yeah it'll it'll it yeah. should read a 2014 file yeah i think i had to downgrade to a 2014 family tree maker file when I exported this branch in order to have something it in order to open up in roots magic seven, which I have also. Mm -hmm. So then I was able to provide him with a roots magic seven file, but I think I took out some of the sourcing so that you could do it the way you would do it. Yeah, there was, there was, there was no sourcing pretty much on anything in that file. Yeah, because um, I, I want to make it. sure that you had the ability to do it the way you would normally do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that and that helped because I will. I looked at it. I was documenting the the sources that you had researched, and um, but um, you know, looked at what's the what's the best way based on the information you gave me on those sources to to uh, create the documentation. So David, the answer is, as Judy Russell says, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you anyone else has a question, you can turn on your mic and ask. Um, if you were look, 
I one from the from the uh, chat. Please. If you were looking at a tree with a citation and sources from Family Search or Ancestry, does the info make it quicker to find info on those sites because the program does it pretty quick. I'm not sure. In a way, what... in a way because if they've yeah. cited it on Ancestry or, you know, in that process and it's linked to a data collection on Ancestry, yeah, you can just click on it and go to that, that, that census image or whatever and see what they saw and say, yeah, that looks right. Yeah, that that's true. So that's um, one way. So I, you still got to do that analysis yourself. You know, did they? Is this real or did they just assume same name, same person? Which happens uh, a lot. Which happens a lot. Yeah. So, does anyone else have a question? I have a question. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. Okay, um, I noticed on a source citation for Edward Charles Prees, you have a birth date and place of the 27th of July, 1874, East Point, Macomb County. Anyway, um, I, there was no East Point in 1874. Okay, I'll, I'll ex <laughs> Yeah, I know Katie's Corners. Um, in order to utilize the, um, here, let me share my screen. Share screen. I can't see anything. Okay, just a second. Just a second. Here. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Um, and you were looking at Edward? Yes. Just a second, let me fly back to Edward. Okay, in Family Tree Maker, um, they have this, um, if I click on it, it's gonna take a little while to load, places workspace. And what it does, I'll click on it and so we can see. Um, what it does is it links the places in your tree file to Bing Maps. In order for it to do that, and to, for you to be able to take advantage of using this map and creating my migration paths and things like that, your locations have to be modern locations. So that's why if you look at my um, location and let me get Bob's face out of here for a minute. Okay, okay. so it's all right. I, I, I minimized it here. I'm not sure okay. if you guys were seeing Bob or not. Uh, okay, so over here in the birth location, I put East Point Macomb, Michigan, USA. And then in the place description, I put then, or I could say at the time, Katie's Corners. So I'm using the modern day location so that I can take advantage of the mapping features, but I am lo recording the, the place at the time to maintain that historical accuracy. It's a compromise that, yeah, those genealogists, us who have been in, in genealogy for a long time and we know we're supposed to record the place as it was known at the time, um, we kind of got to wrestle with that. So that's kind of where that, that, that is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So for my John Ryder, when he died, it was was mm -hmm. the town of Washington, um, Dutchess County, New York. Two years later, the northern part of the town of Washington, where he lived, became the town of San Stanford. So I've got him in as Stanford, Dutchess, New York, USA, and then I have at the time or then, um, town of Washington. And then in my uh, person notes, which you can see down here with the marriage transcription, I have all that and all that, mm -hmm. is where I put the clarification that at the time he died, it was known as the town of Washington. He lived in this particular part. And it two years after he died, it became the town of Stanford. Okay. So it's- I see why you did it. Yeah. Yeah, because when I go to that places, I can click on USA, Michigan, Macomb, East Point, 
and it's on the map. And I can also see who else is all there. And then if I need to make a migration map for the family, I can do that and by at clicking on locations in here, but that's a whole nother presentation. So that's a compromise I, I had to wrestle with and, and make in order to utilize all the features. And when you're merging data in from Ancestry, it's going to merge in as Ancestry's indexers type the location. So you've got that database of locations and you've got the Bing Maps database of locations, but then you got Family Tree Maker's own database of locations and they're all three different. <laughs> so okay. when you clean up your locations, there's reasons why, you know, this came in this, but it's not being recognized. You can see this Doberson isn't being recognized. There's a question mark. Mm -hmm. So I can tell it, yeah, that's where it is. Or I can move the pin and say, this is the where I want it. And then it'll be um, so like here, this came in as Mount Clemens Ward 2. I can change these all to Mount Clemens. And, but like I said, places a whole different ball game of how to change things. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And uh, Ritz Magic does handle that a little bit differently. Um, I can put it in as, let me <coughs> yep. share my screen here real quick. I can put it in. Here, whoop. I'm still on. Okay, Mary Lou, I see your, your question in the chat and I will um, email them directly to you. I know sometimes you have a hard time seeing them in the, in the reminder email. I can put it in under the standardized place name, geocode it, and then change the place name to the original place name. Um, and keep the standardized place name for 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 mapping um, on there, so it will map out uh, if I want to. And uh, I didn't do that change to this um, to the file you Lisa sent me, but on mine it's set up kind of that way based on what and where. So I don't use all standardized place names um, I, as my primary display places. Any other questions? Okay, if you don't have a question about the presentation, I guess we can open the floor up to other genealogy uh, how you, questions. How do you show someone being adopted in Ancestry.com? Ancestry, online tree. Ancestry.com. Thank you for the person who sent the mail today. I finally connected into your meeting I've tried for three months in a row. Thank you for today's messages. Well, guys, if you can hear me, the kid is like three years old when his father dies. Mm -hmm. And at that point, his, wife, his mom remarries and the kid goes on with the second husband's family name the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you call that adoption, but we... As a genealogist, I want to have his given name from from the father who died. I, I, he, he used the he used the adopted name, the second husband's name, his entire life, and I just don't know how to show that. Let me look at one on my tree because um, I know I've got a similar situation. I just um, I've put it into software. I just don't know how ancestry handled it so let me go look at it, it, um, it, it the the, the, the um, ancestry is set up so if you looked at the kid's mom you're going to see that she was married to two different guys right and and it shows that the kid was born to the first husband and and that's that's correct but then you get this adoption when he's three years old and mm -hmm. so so his his name his last name becomes the second husband's last name. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know if what other people are doing. <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay. I'm looking at my situation, which is similar to that in my 
ancestry online tree um which uh, how did i mean i like i said i entered this probably in um in legacy and uploaded it to the ancestry well, actually i i take that back because i ran family tree maker to upload to the ancestry tree because legacy wouldn't um so i entered it in an earlier family tree maker and uploaded it um although i'm not showing the um the biological father i am showing the um yeah i don't have that set up like i have it in my database i don't know why it's not um and that tree is linked i don't know why it's not it's not working um the way it is but it is it it definitely does have um stepfather and then biological mother listed on the on the tree i just don't quite know um how and why it why it uploaded that way um i think if you go to the ancestry family tree um add family member spouse son daughter brother sister um, um i don't know if the ancestry family tree can can attach more than one parent to the same uh to the same person um or one set of parents i know a lot of your genealogy software can legacy could and and um, and roots magic can but um i uh i don't have a really great answer although it looks like lisa's coming back on <laughs> Unmute, Lisa. Yeah, sorry. Did the recording stop? No, the re the recording's still going on. It just okay, you dropped off. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, lost internet here. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oopsie. At least you hit the button, or or Teresa did. Someone did. Because I was I was on Teresa's account, so. <laughs> okay. Uh. So I started. I got back in. Okay, go I, ahead. I started to answer uh, Mr. Horton's question as best I could. Did you have okay. any other insight? Um, it, it, that's what knocked me. Oh, I don't know if that's what knocked me off. Yeah. Hang on. Let me go back to where I was. Okay. In the profile page, I clicked on the person and I was under edit relationships when I lost um, connection. So under father and mother, there's a tag here, biological, click yes. on that, change it to adopted, or you can add an alternate parent and make, tell, and hook them up as adopted or step or foster or whatever the relationship is. So that's how you do it with an ancestry online tree. You go to the, you go to the section that offers you relationships and you'll find an adoption tag. I didn't quite hear you. You're go to the you're suggesting go, go to the relationship and, and look for it. Look for the appropriate uh, adopt and. Well, you go to the person's profile. We're talking yeah. about an ancestry online member. You know, a member tree. Yeah, so you yeah. bring up that person's profile. Yeah. You bring up. Show the tools. You want to choose to show the okay. tools, and, okay. and edit buttons up there. With a, okay. a drop down arrow, you click on edit relationships. Yeah. And then you, if you've got someone there, um, you can click as adopted or down in the children's area. You can change it from biological to adopted, step, foster, related, guardian, private, or unknown. So there's two ways you can do it at the parent level or at the child level. Yes. Clearly. Okay, I hope I know how to un. I hope I know how to go back to mute. Thank you. Okay. And I want to thank everybody for putting that notice out today because this is the first meeting I've made in three months, and I've been trying to get to it. Well, thank you. what I explained to you, John, in the email before is that um, your the, the email that you sent was a different email than what we had for you. Oh. That's that's what I explained what the problem was. You. Because your the email that we had for you obviously wasn't going to your phone or whatever device you were looking at. Because the email you sent was a different one, so I added that one for merci you. For, merci many times. Thank you. Okay. Am I sharing my screen at that point, Bob? 
No, you weren't. Oh, I forgot to click. Okay. Hang on. Let me go back to Zoom. All right. Share screen. Sorry about that. Okay. So over here, let me get rid of us. Okay. Over here on a person's profile, you're going to go to edit relationships. And then if you need to change the parent, you click on this tag, drop down here and change it to whatever you want. If you need to change the child, then you got to be on the parent, either mother or father, and then edit relationships and then change the child relationship to the parent to whatever you need, adopted step, foster related guardian, whichever. And then if you need to add alternate parents to, if you know who the adopted the biological adopted you can add alternate parents that way okay hope that helps everyone including john but, uh, <laughs> stop sharing for a moment all right so thank you bob for helping me with this thank you lisa and uh now i got to get working on next month <laughs> yeah <laughs> I got to get weeding. <laughs> well, I got to do that too. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Our next meeting is scheduled for June 9th, 2021. For our June meeting, MCGG's Robert McGarry will present new AI tools for organizing digital photos. Last but not least, MCGG extends its thanks to the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting. Goodbye, everyone.